the things I wanted to show you, which I didn't get to show you last time was, uh, let's see, I hope I have it here. This is the trend I wanted to show you last time, which I didn't get a chance to do, was um, the trends in, we talked about RF CMOS, if you remember, right? So more and more um, circuits are packed on the same chip. So in 2000 time frame, um, you know, if you remember those radios I showed you, and we talked about by CMOS technology, bipolars are inherently better in terms of high speed performance, uh, which you already know, because we talked about it in the CMOS class. And um, initially, uh, all the analog functionality was done in by CMOS, and slowly you could see that over a period of years, it's becoming all CMOS. And it's not just becoming CMOS, but uh, you know, there is crazy level of in integration that's going on. Uh, because today's iPhone has like, I don't know how many transceivers built into it, uh, many of which we talked about. And uh, uh, see, they, they, uh, the Apple wants to produce just one phone. Uh, they don't want to produce uh, multiple phones for multiple regions, so uh, that's a lot of inventory cost, um, and you know they have to you have to design a lot of things, and you have to make sure that everything works. Instead, they just develop one thing, which is software control, and you you send it out everywhere. The same phone works. Um, in early days, uh, it used to be that the phone made in India would have been different, targeted for different frequencies and uh, they would try to optimize the cost like that. So that doesn't work anymore. So nowadays, all the phones. So, so the point is that the single chip has all these transceivers, like, you know, for different frequencies um, and uh, different bands and different types of modulation. So the level of integration is just mind boggling. Um, and on the Y axis, uh, what you're seeing is the level of integration on the X axis you're seeing the year, you know, and the last one uh, I picked up was 2015 uh, because that's the data I could find. And in early days, the power amplifier was never integrated, but now that is also being integrated. Now, power amplifier is something that really delivers power. So when it's delivering power, things get hot. And then um, it's also coupling to the sensitive receive circuit. So uh, that's, that's like a really big deal, you know. So uh, uh, I just wanted to bring this uh, to your attention, where things are going. And if you end up working in this field, uh, you will be working for Broadcom, Qualcomm, Max Linear, uh, or any other analog companies. You would be working on these kind of chips, and you would have your own real estate that you'll be working on. You'll be developing the blocks, and as you get better and better, you get control of more and more real estate. Eventually, to the person who actually, you know, is in charge of the chip, um, um, you know, as as you grow in your career. But you, as a as a designer, your job will be to to design variety of blocks and uh, get better at it and understand the implications. Basically, if I do something over here, what happens? Um, are there implications at a top level, right? So those are the things. As we go through this course, we will, we will, I'll bring that out. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you is that it's not just the chip anymore, right? So, um, let me, uh, so this is an interesting, uh, interesting uh, drawing, uh, which will tell you, uh, you know, as you go to these high frequencies, um, it's not just the, the, the part here that you're seeing is the chip that you will be designing, for example, okay? Now, um, you know, that's not where all the action is. What happens is that you have to bring out the signal or bring in the signal from outside world. And a uh, lot of times that's where the bottleneck is. So uh, as a RF designers, you are, you are involved in this piece also. You know, how do you, how do you interact with the outside world? And many times you can do lots of things on the chip, but you cannot interface with the outside world. So you have to be sensitive to that fact. The packaging technology is one of the important aspects also uh, when you start designing circuits. So um, typically when you start uh, the project, you start with um, some block diagram and then you want to decide your package and uh, you have to th think about how much power you're going to dissipate on this chip, what will be the thermal coefficient, what will be the temperature of the chip after this much power dissipation, uh, do you need a heat sink? So all these high level uh, decisions need to be taken. It's not like you start with an op-amp design and you build it up from there. So there are multiple levels under which you will, uh, you will work. Uh, and the packaging technology is really critical because uh, the packaging technology will present a lot of parasitics. If you know what parasitics means, do you know what parasitics, parasitic is? I think uh, most of you, uh, I think you went through, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I need to recalibrate. All of you were in my previous class, so you know what parastix is. Um, so parastix is something that you don't desire. 
which is there and is going to hurt you. So in this case, you have inductors, they will have um, um, bond wires which will have inductance and also they will have mutual coupling with the adjacent line. So if you have a lot of switching noise, then that will couple and it will desense. Uh, your, um, you know, ultra sensitive RF input line. Uh, not just that, once you come out of the package, what will happen is you will, uh, you will have a board, right? So the parasitics on the board also you will have to be taken into account. Because finally that's where the rubber meets the road as they call it, right? This is where you, you interact with the outside world. So you have to take into account all these things while you are designing the circuit inside. If you are anywhere into the LNA design, PA design, uh, those kind of activities, okay? So it's really important to keep all these things into um, uh, into your um, you know back of your mind, uh, so that you understand that there are you know you know the top whatever I say 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 here is a, a grounds and power supplies, right? The, when you do simulations, you will you will put ideal voltage source and all those things. Doesn't work that way. Once you start uh, the real chip design, you have to have a model of the package, you have to have a model of the supply inductance and any parasitics, um, and um, so that you can you can account for all those effects. Okay, so this is something that you need to keep uh, in the back of your mind while you're designing your circuits. I just wanted to show that to you. Okay, so let's move on to today's lecture. Okay, so today's topic is. Um, so we will go through some RF basics uh, to get you um, uh, acclimatized to RF design portion. And the first thing we will talk about is S parameters. Now this course I wanted it to be a lot more uh, like um, when you when it comes to RF class we can go really deep into S parameters, really deep into switch charts and we will end up. Uh, going through five, six lectures and then we will miss out a lot of interesting stuff. So what I'm doing is I'm just highlighting some of the key things in these classes and then if you want a deeper theory, you can always go back to the references and uh, and go there and we can talk about it. Uh, but I wanted to uh, focus this class more into CMOS and you know doing circuits in the RF CMOS so that um, you know you, you, you still have the fundamentals of S parameters and then matching theory and all. Um, okay, so what is S parameters? S means uh, here scattering and uh, scattering, when, when it comes to scattering, what comes to your mind? You know light waves, right? When you, um, when you shine a light um, and if you have let's say lens, okay? Um, and if you, if you shine a light, then right, part of the light is scattering back and part of the light gets transmitted, right? So scattering is something that reflects back. So that's what scattering parameters are, okay? So let's, uh, let's go through motivation of uh, scattering parameters. I think all of you are familiar with uh, Z parameters, right? So you have, let's say, two port network, okay? And then uh, this is your V1 and I1, the current going in, and you have V2 and I2. Like this, and um, we we are uh, we are comfortable in analyzing this with Z parameters, right? For example, so how do you write your Z parameters? You have V1 and V2 on the left side, which is equal to Z11, Z12, uh, Z21, and Z22. Okay, and here we have I1 and I2. You are all familiar with this notation, right? Matrix. Notation? Okay. All right. So, um, uh, similarly, there are uh, other parameters like Y parameter, H parameter, G parameter. I'm not going to talk about that, but this is a good enough example. So, how do you figure out for a network Z11, Z12, all those things? Do you know how to do that? Um, let's say you don't know what's inside the box, two port network, right? And you're trying to figure out how do I get all these values? Can anybody suggest? Have you learned something like this before? No? Okay. Let me give you a clue. Um, in, this param in this particular case, let's say I left this circuit open, out, then what will you get? What will happen first of all? I2 will be 0, right? So once I2 is 0, then you can get Z11, let's say, by measuring V1. So you can do short circuit and open circuit, both. Uh, games you can play to quickly determine what, uh, what Z11, so you do short circuit. I think this is network theory that you've learned before, right? An open circuit. Okay. Now, um, 
all this stuff is fine and dandy for z parameters but uh, this works only at low frequencies okay if let's say you went to really high frequencies then uh, can you really create these short circuits and open circuits right how would you do that and that is generally not possible because anytime you try to do a short circuit uh, for measurements then that particular short will have an inductance over there and sometimes you can have a feedback which will make the circuit oscillate and you will be it will be very hard for you to characterize the circuit and that's where this s parameter concept comes into play okay so s parameters are uh, easier to measure at high frequency and it's only a relative measurement okay and we'll talk about what that means and um, so in s parameters the way uh, things are defined is as follows there is uh, this is a two port network and you have an incident wave and you have a reflected wave again here we have incident wave and you have a reflected wave coming out okay now we can call it um, uh, VI1. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it's not voltages, it's power actually, but let's uh, for the nomenclature we can we can say VI2 and this is VR1 and VR2. Okay. So this, this is a power waveform that's going in the circuit and it's coming back, returning back. Similarly on this other side, and then we write um, the um, VR1 and VR2. These are the reflected waveforms is equal to, I mean, um, is given by S11, S12, S21, S22, something like this, VI1, VI2, okay. So um, when we, um, and again I have not shown you a impedance here that's the characteristic impedance z naught z naught i'm going to explain all this stuff okay just bear with me for a few minutes and uh, things are normalized so that um, these things are like a v divided by square root of z naught okay so if you square this term it will look like power it will look like a v square divided by z z naught okay and then um, so let me explain just one second. It's also many times you also represent them like this. B1 and B2 is equal to S11, S12, S21, S, S22. I'll explain what this is. A1 and A2. Okay. Now S11, this parameter is given by B1 divided by A1, B1 being the reflected wave, a, a, B being the reflected waves at that port and A being the incident waves at that port and wave is the power, uh, the unit is power, it can be square or it can be square root uh, of the power, when it becomes square root it is V over square root of Z, okay. And in this case what we do is we say A2 is equal to 0, okay. So, this is uh, given by R1, this is uh, input reflection, okay. So what this means is that um, when, uh, when you want to measure S11, okay, you are trying to make A2 equal to 0, so which means uh, there is no, no incident. Uh, let me redraw this picture so that you okay. A1 is going this way and B1 is coming back, A2 is coming going this way and B2 is going out. Okay. So um, when we are trying to measure S11, we, we just make sure that there is no, no power input from the right side. Okay, and then you can measure S11, uh, which is uh, S11 is B1 divided by A1. Same type of uh, logic that we used before, 
and then uh, and S11 is the reflection coefficient which means that I am pushing in A1 power and I am getting B1 back. So, uh, S11 represents what is reflected back at that port, okay. And similarly, you can do S22 which is the power reflected at the output port at this port. So, S22 will be B2 divided by A2 when A1 is equal to 0 and is given by gamma 2, okay. And this is called output reflection coefficient. Huh. Yeah, let me let me come to that. I'm going to talk about that just in few seconds. Okay, I'll have to go give you an example also of this, and then you'll get it. Okay, so you don't really look at them as just voltages and currents, but you look at the product of voltage and current together at every point. Okay. Yeah, it's like um, um, think about this, right? You're you're pushing water uh, through a pipe, um, and there is a um, there is a uh, discontinuity somewhere in your circuit, right? Part of the water will go forward and part of it will come back, right? So, you are you are separating uh, incident water and reflected back water and you are and whatever is going through the thing at that interface and that is what uh, it means by that, okay? I am going to ref I am going to go through this many, many times, okay? Do not worry about it, okay? Is there? Correct, yeah, I am going to go through an example for you, okay. This is a very common question, so I am going to explain that, okay. Um, let us get through the definition first and then we will get to it, okay. And we talked about S11 and S22, right. Now let us do um, S21 is given by B2 divided by A1 when A2 is equal to 0, okay. So, what this means is I am um, pushing in A1, okay, and I am getting B2. I am not, I am not putting A2, A2 is 0, okay, there is no reflected, uh, there is no, uh, no, uh, no input power from the other side, okay, and then, um, uh, then, uh, then you get uh, um, A1 going in and you get B2 out, which means that what is the transmission from one port to another port, okay. So, this is called forward gain. Again, this is square root of power, uh, square root of uh, power, okay. And S12 is equal to B1 divided by A2, A1 is equal to 0. So, in this case, what does that this mean? It is a reverse gain, okay. S22 we already talked about. So, let us go through a one port example and then uh, then we can. Uh, so, so far you are okay with the definitions? You got the definitions, right? Um, the, the thing that I am going to answer is what is this power, incident power wave and reflected power wave, okay. I am just showing it to you one more time, okay. So, let us take one port example. So, let us say a real circuit. Um, Z naught is the input impedance, characteristic impedance and this is your Z in let us say and there is plus minus V1 here, okay. So, let us figure out what is the, um, uh, what is the reflected power and then what is the, so we will we'll figure that out now. So, let us draw the interface right here, okay. This is the one port network. So, reflected power is given by, um, so let us say this was, there was an ideal match here, okay. Ideal, um, the only time you will uh, transfer maximum amount of power is when these two impedances are equal, that you know, right. So, then um, that is called available power, available and then uh, what is actual input power, okay. And that much amount of power will be reflected back, right. 
if this was an ideal impedance connection uh, Z naught, then you will have available power which will be um, uh, Vs square uh, divided by 4 Z naught, okay. And then this Pn, okay, is going to be uh, because uh, the impedance can be complex. I mean, you know, so you have to figure out power in terms of, uh, okay, by the way, I should give you a reference here. He has a chapter on S parameters. So that is where this comes from. And then um, this input power is given by V um, at this point is V1 I1 complex conjugate plus V I I1 okay, and half of that. I am just taking average of that. And we will figure out what the, the formula tells us to. And you have to do a whole bunch of algebra, but I am just going to give you the way about how to do this. The reason for this is uh, this Z in may not be just real impedance, it can be a complex impedance, okay. And uh, because it can be a complex impedance, the phasors, voltage and current may not be uh, right lined, lined on top of each other. So then you have to figure out power when they are lined up on top of each other, right. You, you take a projection and that is why you do complex conjugate uh, algebra, okay. So let, let me give you an example here. So, uh, let's say voltage has e to the power j alpha and current has e to the power j beta, okay. Then when we take uh, complex conjugate, you will do um, voltage times current e to the power j alpha minus beta. That is what we are trying to do. So, that is and then we are trying, trying to take a real part of that, that, that thing, okay. So when we figure out this P in part, what you do is you take half of uh, V1 and I1 star, okay. What is I1 given here? Can somebody tell? I1 is the current that flows through this network. So this will be I1 is um, Vs divided by Z, Z0 plus Zn, right. That is our I1. Correct. And what is V1? Uh, V1 is equal to Z in divided by Z in plus Z naught times Vs. Okay. So you can put all these things here in this expression uh, to figure out this input power. Okay. I am not going through the each and every step of the derivation. You will get it when you uh, when you look at the notes or you can look at the reference, but the final result I want to show you. So you would basically do this, we will take Z in divided by Z in plus uh, Z naught Vs and then other one will be Vs star divided by Z in plus Z naught complex conjugate plus Z in complex conjugate divided by Z in plus Z naught complex conjugate. This is the V star part times Vs divided by Z in plus Z naught, okay. So you could, once you solve this, you will see that it comes out to be Vs square P in power input is given by Vs square divided by 2 Z naught, okay, and Z naught Z in plus Z in star divided by Z in plus Z naught, something like this. And um, then if you substitute in this expression right here, okay, I will show you the result. The algebra you can try it out yourself, but the result is more, uh, more interesting. The reflected power, P reflected is given by P available multiplied by Z in minus Z naught divided by Z in plus Z naught square, okay. And this part is what we call as the reflection coefficient. Okay. 
So, conversely, if you um, you can say that z in is equal to once you know the reflection coefficient, you can say that z in is equal to z naught 1 plus gamma divided by 1 minus gamma. Okay. There are a lot of definitions, so initially it will be a little bit hard, but I am going to go through this again and again many times. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, which one? Reflected power, yeah. This one, this one? The second, no? yeah, yeah. Huh. Yes, yes. And I am taking both these combinations. The second combination is other way around, V star I1, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. V1 star I1. Yeah, V1. Both. It's projection of both. Um, I don't want to explain this right now because it's a lot of derivation. Um, yes, it is. It. V1 I1. Correct. You, you're talking about this term, right? Yeah. I mean, you can remove this half and just use one term or you can do projection of each one on each one of them. You know, each vector lining up on the other vector will give you the power, right? So, you can just use one, but in this case, I am using every vector lining up on top of it and taking average of it, okay? That is the theory, network theory expression I am using right now. Uh, I do not want to go into this, but I can give you an explanation of this separately, okay? But the point we are trying to get to from all these uh, equations is the following is the reflected power you know is available power times z1 minus z0. I am just showing you how you get there basically how do you get this expression. You will generally see this expression and then you just have to accept it, but I am just trying to show you how you get to that point uh, through this derivation. Okay? All right. So, z1 what this tells you is um, if z in is equal to z0, okay? if the two impedances are matched then what will happen? The reflected power will be 0 and you will be delivering it completely to the uh, uh, load and uh, that that is that is the key point we are trying to make here, okay. And this gamma is the reflection coefficient, okay. In this particular case, um, since we are talking about power here, this is gamma square, okay, which and gamma is given by z in minus z naught divided by z in plus z naught uh, that expression, okay. So, uh, to give you an example, right, uh, this matching, matching, uh, you know, what is this matching? I am kind of alluding to the matching word all the time, but I am not explaining it yet, okay. So, uh, to give you a, give you a, um, I mentioned this already, let us imagine that you have a pipe, okay, water pipe, okay, and there is water coming out of this in this direction, okay. Now, I have to put it into another different dimension pipe, okay. Then what will happen is part of the water or let us say air or some kind of gas because water will only fall down and then you will see that um, you know everything will go into the next pipe, right and that is not a good analogy. Let us say there is a gas coming out of this and then what will happen is part of the gas will go forward, part of the gas will come out, right, will get, uh, get out um, and leak out that is like reflected power. So, because this, um, this particular interface is not matched right now, okay, that is why this is happening. So, um, so, matching conceptually what we are trying to do is we want to make sure that the impedances are matched at the at the interface so that um, whatever is going in uh, goes forward. We want to maximize the amount of uh, power going to the neighboring next circuit uh, and we want to avoid the reflections coming back and that is the that is the point of uh, this exercise and we will go through a few examples and it will be clear. I know this example is not exactly. Uh, exactly convincing, but we will go through many more of this, okay. Uh, not very clear, maybe I muddle my way around this particular example. I will do one more, I will do a better job one more time, a little bit later, okay. Okay. Uh, so, again, you know, uh, as I said, goal is uh, in RF circuits is to What do we want to maximize in terms of S parameters? Huh? Transmission we want to maximize which is S21 we want to maximize, 
okay and what do I want we want to minimize everything s12 you don't want anything reflecting uh, basically trans, uh, from output anything you won't, don't want to come back because otherwise you'll have oscillations right if you have, and then you also you want to make sure your s11 and s22 okay they are uh, they are minimized okay so having said that let's go through some units uh, fundamental units for rf and this is from uh, razavi chapter 2 So we have um, voltage, current and then power, when it comes to power we talk about V square or I square, okay. So um, I think all of you are familiar with dB now, by now, dB is uh, relates to ratios. Okay, not absolute. volts or amps, there is no unit, okay. So voltage gain, this is for people who were not in the last year's uh, last class, um, we say A voltage gain in dB, that is given by 20 log um, V out or V in, okay. I think all of you know this, right. And then uh, power gain. AP is also given in dB and that is given as 10 log P out divided by P in, okay. Now power is V square, right and this will be also V square so that, that square will come here and it will come over here, okay. So uh, only time will AP equal to A in, uh, AV. Only when uh, input and output uh, reference um, a resistance, their reference uh, is uh, to the same resistance. Okay. By that, what I mean is um, um, you can have a circuit where um, you have a box, input is. Um, match to a different impedance, output is matched to a different impedance, then the power gain will be different compared to the voltage gain because uh, uh, when you compute power output, it will be referred to the matching impedance at the output, okay. So uh, if, if they are referred to the same impedance, then what will happen is this will become V out divided by Z, uh, Z out square and this will be also the same number, V in square divided by Z out, okay. And then Z out will cancel out and then you will get 20 times log 10 uh, V out by V. Is this clear? The square part comes out, okay. But if the impedances are not the same, uh, the input versus output, then you will have a, uh, uh, that you have to take into account. The voltage gain and power gain will not be the same. dBm, what does M signify? Milliwatt, okay. So this is also a power unit. M signifies 1 milliwatt. So in this case, power in dBm is given by 10 log of whatever the power number you are talking about divided by 1 milliwatt, okay. And we already uh, went through an example 30 dBm would be, what would be 30 dBm equal to? Huh? 1 watt and 60 dBm would be? 1 kilowatt, okay, all right. Now um, the dBm part, um, even though we say power, right, it's, it depends on the reference um, system that you are using. So uh, let us say that you are, um, it is important to define the reference impedance, okay. Uh, so there are multiple ways um, and I am going to go through them. Sometimes uh, it's 75 ohms, sometimes it's 50 ohms, right, outside world matching. Um, and um, so let's say we are using 75 ohm system. 
okay then um, what does 0 dBm mean in this case okay so we have let's say there is V uh, resistance of 75 ohms and then you have a voltage across that of V peak okay so then V peak square divided by 2 times 75 that would be the power right correct V peak uh, square divided by 2 gives you the RMS and um, right and then 75 ohms is uh, V square by R, uh, R right that is the power uh, the V being the RMS part okay so this becomes equal to 1 milliwatt okay and you can solve this and you will see that V peak is given by uh, 387 millivolts peak okay so if you have a sine wave then uh, this is uh, 387 millivolts okay and if you want to define RMS then uh, V RMS is given by 273.8 millivolts RMS. So these two numbers correspond to 0 dBm in a 75 ohm system. Is this part clear? The, the, the definition part, okay. Sometimes you use 50 ohms, okay. I am going to explain to you why 50 ohms, why 75 in, in, in a short time. But let us say if you are using 50 ohm system, yes peak voltage, yeah. Yeah. So, V peak is 387 millivolts peak, but V RMS is just conversion of that by root 2, okay. That is given by 273.8 millivolts RMS. So, you can, you just have to make sure that you know these units really well because you can make a quick mistake in either of these units and then your whole, all calculations will, uh, will get messed up. So, uh, I am just going through the fundamental, um, you know, definitions in, in RF. Um, so that you are aware of all these things. Basically, when do you use 50 ohms, when do you use 75 ohms and what are the numbers associated with that, okay. So then in, in 75 ohm system, uh, 50 ohm system, um, V peak square by 2 and times 50, okay. That is equal to 1 milliwatt. And then in this case, V peak is equal to 316 millivolts peak and uh, I mean and, and VRMS is equal to 223 millivolts RMS, same calculation, okay. So now you have two different sets of numbers. You do not have to remember them but you just have to know that how we got there basically. But typically you only talk about dBm numbers uh, whenever you are characterizing an RF, uh, RF block, okay. Okay, the next thing um, is uh, the unit is dBv. What does that refer to? Can you guess? dBv is a voltage gain, uh, but it refers to 1 volt, okay. V, this V represents 1 volt, okay. So 1 volt represents 0 dBv. And generally the input to the A to D converter or things like that, they, there, you, uh, there you are uh, looking at the actual signal uh, value, okay, the, in volts. So there you use dB volts. Um, and there could be dB uh, millivolt RMS also and these are generally RMS, okay, both these are RMS or if it is not RMS then you will put peak into it. So let us say if you say dB volts peak, okay, that means 1 volt peak is equal to 0 dB volt peak, okay. So you have to put this index uh, to signify and when you say dB millivolt RMS that is also common, commonly used and what do you think that would be? What is 0 dB MV RMS? Refer to 1 millivolt RMS, okay. So these are the some of the commonly used terms that you will see. Yet another term that is used is dBc, okay. So dBc is, C signifies a carrier, okay, value. So let us say that um, you know if you look at a spectrum, this is power relative to carrier, okay. Let us say you see, see this in RF, you see a spectrum of uh, signal, right and you see uh, let us say this is your uh, omega wanted, you desire that, this is desired frequency tone and then you see something down here which is not wanted. Then the difference between these two is what is called dBc, 
okay. So, what you say is um, let us say this is uh, tone F 2 and this is F 0 let us say. F 2 is you know 30 dB C below F 0, uh, it is 30 dB down and that is what uh, the and, and on this side you have dB m power whatever that you are putting in, okay. So, that is the these are the fundamental uh, nomenclatures that people use in RF. I just wanted to bring it out up front so that you understand all the all the nomenclature. Hmm? You generally say below okay or you can say minus 30 dBc down something like that. But uh, generally when you say dBc uh, it has to be you know below the carrier, it has to be below carrier yeah. Huh. Yeah, so if like, very good question right, I, I just wanted to simplify the example for you, but typically um, and we are going to go through all this, uh, this is like we are jumping uh, 7, 8 lectures ahead right. Uh, Let us say you have a voltage control oscillator or an oscillator. So, when you the, the, the desired um, spectrum of that oscillator is this, okay, this is what I want as an oscillator, but in reality you can get that because there are a whole bunch of noise components and things like that. And then so the what you would get is that looks something like this, right. So then what you do is hey this is my desired tone right here, this is the desired strength and then you measure the power in small bandwidth uh, over here and then you refer it back, okay. This is the DVC measurement, okay. To And to quantify you generally say this uh, this voltage control oscillator specification, let us say you wanted to quantify right. You would say that I want something for example, uh, there is a project that we are working on where the specifications are minus 80 dBc hmm, below the carrier all right and then at 2 megahertz offset okay. So, this distance is 2 megahertz I have specified this, let us say this frequency is 5 gigahertz okay. And then at 2 megahertz offset I want this to be 80 dBc down compared to the main main low and that is the way you define it. And then uh, once you define that then um, then you pretty much know the characteristic of that that VCO all right. We are going to get there uh, but but very good question indeed. Uh, here I just wanted to simplify it for you so, so you understand the, the specification by itself. Any questions so far? Okay. Okay, so there is a new topic I want to go after this into and it is not maybe not your favorite topic because you probably expected that you know really you want me to talk about RLC circuits now, but that is where it all begins right. So, let us start about RLC circuits okay. So, please do not be disappointed um, because I am sure you have been doing inductors uh, fundamentals of uh, electrical circuits right. Uh, but but RLC circuits are a big, big, big part of uh, part of RF circuits, um, and it's important to to understand um, these components um, uh, when you are doing RF design. Okay. So again, we are talk, going to talk about passive RLC circuit. Okay, and this part is covered in Lee chapter three and Razavi. Uh, Razavi, I think I just have a page number is 62 if I remember. Okay, so let us draw a really simple RLC circuit. This is the current in. All of the, all of you are familiar with this circuit, right? And this is my V out. Okay, so what's the impedance um, looking here? Can somebody say? Let's say y. Y is the inverse of the or conductance or um, admittance, right? So y is given by g, g being one over resistance plus j omega c plus one over j omega l. So it's a matter of convenience, you know. When you do parallel circuits, you always use the admittance, and when you do series circuits, you use the impedance. Just because for me, math is a lot cleaner that way. Okay, so that's my y, and we can uh, we can take this further, saying that g plus j omega. Hmm? Let's get the j out. 
and it's omega c minus 1 over omega l okay so at dc what happens who dominates inductor will dominate right because it will create a short and at high frequency c dominates the c will become a short right at high frequency and it won't let any of the current uh, and then uh, there is something called resonance right at resonance what happens i think all of you are probably familiar with this right resonance term this term will become will cancel out right the omega c will equal to 1 over omega l and then you will just get a real part g that's what you will get so at resonance which is happening at omega omega not frequency omega c equal to 1 over omega not l okay and so this gives you omega not equal to 1 over square root of lc so this is the result that you have already seen many many times in your lifetime right okay all right so uh, this is our resonance frequency so a few rule of thumbs uh, that you need to uh, you have to maintain uh, and again you know as um, as you do circuit design right you have to keep some things uh, as uh, the way i have shown you milli uh, dbm um, over period of time you will kind of acquire this habit of visualizing what dbm means every time you don't have to go and calculate 1 milliwatt and that's what i'm trying to get you to do um, and similarly um, when you are looking at uh, resonant frequencies right you should not have to calculate every time with l and c and square root and put it in the calculator right because then by that time people have already uh, you know they have moved on to something else so to uh, to kind of peg it in your head right uh, one nano henry and one picofarad okay when you take these two numbers then your resonant frequency is 5 gigahertz okay so this is something that you should kind of memorize and once you have that in your head then any variation around that you can quickly figure out the resonance frequency okay so it's a good way to uh, memorize um, uh, some key numbers and if it's 2.5 nano henry and 10 picofarad and then resonance frequency is 1 gigahertz just a short like a uh, way to remember uh, these numbers and this will uh, kind of keep you on top of your game when you are when there is a design review going on and somebody asks you a question but what if i change this capacitor by this much if you have this in your head then you will be able to quickly answer the question and really impress the hell out of that person right so uh, i like to keep these uh, you know uh, in the back of your mind so that you can quickly answer the questions and kind of tell uh, where it's going right otherwise if you go to calculator and try to figure it out you know people have lost interest in that question so it's a good way to memorize i mean i uh, I, I recommend that you memorize these couple of numbers not too many okay now next thing we're going to talk about which is uh, is quality factor are you exposed to quality factor before coming to this class hmm? what is your quality factor It's a very philosophical question, right? Okay. Okay. Let's not get there. Okay. Quality factor is something. Uh, what does quality factor do, right? It's a goodness of uh, that component, right? How good that component is. So if the quality is good, that means the Q number should be really, really high. I mean, so for example, I mean, I hate to brag because I'm from this institute. The quality factor of IITNs is probably very high right you should be able to say that so uh, i'm deviating from the main thing so it's a goodness of uh, uh, passive components okay so if q is zero then that's not good okay so you want q to be as high as possible so q is equal to omega and the way it's uh, and actually passive but it's reactive components important note is reactive components only generally you don't specify quality factor for a resistor okay as a because it's always going to dissipate the energy right so um, so it's only defined for uh, energy stored divided by 
एवरेज पावर डिसिपेटेड दैट्स द वे यू डिफाइन इट ओके एंड इट कैन बी एप्लीकेबल टू अ सिंगल कंपोनेंट और नेटवर्क बोथ and we're going to go through all these examples okay so in our uh, the circuit that we talked about just now let's 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 evaluate that this part right what is the quality factor of this network right so let's figure out how much is the energy stored versus how much is the energy dissipated so in this particular example we could say that um, q is equal to omega and what is the energy dissip uh, energy stored you know the energy across uh, stored in a capacitor right for example so let's talk about just ha huh? half c v peak square right and let's call it v o peak square because that's at the output okay and what's the energy dissipated Uh, v out whatever uh, v peak right is the waveform here how much is the energy dissipated very good so energy dissipated is v peak square by 2r okay v o square divided by 2r okay so then q is given by at resonance it will become omega not rc this is at resonance this is a general expression but this is what it is now we already said omega not is what is omega not lc right so this becomes r divided by the c goes down here and this becomes l by c something like this okay and this is a uh, dimensions of resistance and it's also called characteristic impedance okay what is it no it's either stored in the capacitor or it's in the inductor right because it will go back and forth back and forth yeah ha huh? you will do that and if you do series circuit then you can do the inductor energy okay okay so far everything clear hmm? so the key thing is q is unitless it's just a number okay quality is 1000 million or 10 or 1 1 one is not good because that means uh, you know you are spending lot of lot of energy is being wasted hmm. Hmm. no which one are you talking about? energy stored in the network yeah correct ha huh. yeah 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 i mean we'll go through all variety of formulas but this is something that you know quickly right half cv square so we just took this example you can do the yes yes it is function of frequency correct no it's still you measure just the what is the frequency uh, at that frequency what is the voltage across the capacitor right whatever you see and then uh, then you do half cv square um, it can be for a single component also or it can be for a network so in that network um, how much energy is, uh, is stored in the reactive components versus how much energy is being dissipated energy dissipated is very clear right that's very clear yeah yeah, yeah. energy stored yes correct it will go back and forth back and forth with it that will happen yes yes no no that at other frequencies you will have one part dominate versus other right correct yeah but see in a parallel network whatever finally observable is that voltage across that capacitor right and you will see that voltage
करेक्ट इट्स ओनली वैलिड एट रेजोनेंट इज इट ओनली वैलिड एट रेजोनेंट इट्स करेक्ट 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 no no it should not be i don't think it should be valid only at resonance let me think about that how to answer that question but i'll get back to you on that one okay if the inductor is ideal quality right then uh, it really doesn't matter ha huh. correct your omega not will keep changing at that point right omega not will keep changing yeah omega not um, the, but the omega not is changing right as soon as you change the inductance value the omega not will also move along with it and this will happen only that q will happen only at that that frequency very good very good logic yes yes i agree i agree but let me think about how to explain that a little bit better one more time okay i'll get back to you on that one um i don't have anything uh, on the tip of my tongue right now but uh, i got your question um okay so at resonance uh, we we substituted omega not rc okay and then this is r over uh, this is the dimension of the resistance right here and then um, let's do uh, at resonance your capacitors impedance or inductor okay inductor is omega not l right and here also you can say that it's uh, square root of lc and that becomes square root of lc okay the value of the inductance is the same and also the capacitor we already did this will be equal to 1 over um omega not uh, c and here we uh, we will put square root of lc divided by c is equal to square root of lc okay so the impedance of the capacitance as well as the inductance is the same at resonance that's what i'm trying to show okay so if you have a purely reactive network okay then uh, then there is no energy dissipated right r is equal to in uh, infinity in this case so then in that case uh, q will be uh, what this tells you is q is equal to infinity okay so value of q is given by r divided by in this particular case we just said that right this one so one expression for q was um, what was the one expression we derived just now is uh, r omega not c okay the other expression would be r divided by z of uh, l or c which is equal to r divided by omega not l so this is another expression for for q other than this for this resonant circuit only okay at that frequency omega not so this is only valid for resonant circuit now many times what you will see uh, um um other way to remember this right is um let's say you have a uh, just an element like this okay so this is this is the way i have modeled the inductor okay so you have a resistance and you have an inductor so what is the quality of this inductor yeah the q factor for this inductor is given by r over omega not l now r has to be large if r is small then the quality of the inductor is bad right because uh, it doesn't look like an inductor anymore right so uh, you have to have a large r 
and you divide it down by this reactive part omega naught L which is what uh, this, this thing is showing ok. Now however, if you have a uh, inductor represented like this right R S and L then what is the Q of this yeah it is flipped other way around Q is equal to omega naught L divided by R because R is should be as small as possible is really tiny because it is a series resistance now right. So, this Q definition is omega naught R L divided by R, R should be as small as well. So, similarly you can do the same thing uh, with capacitors ok. So, let us say you have a capacitor and you have a resistance right C and R. So, what is the Q of this capacitor, quality of this capacitor? R should be very large right. So, then R comes in the numerator ok and then you put omega naught C with it ok because it is R divided by the impedance 1 over omega naught C right and then that is what you get. Is this part clear? I am giving you an intuitive way of telling uh, the quality of the and, and similarly if you have a resistance and a capacitor ok R and C and then what do you want? You want resistance to be as small as possible. So, the quality of this capacitor will be omega naught C divided by R sorry other way around 1 over R omega naught C ok. So, this is the way you define it for individual elements um, and you have to take into account you have to always remember that um, the quality is good when the when that deficiency or the non ideality is is smallest right. So, in this case you want R to be as large as possible, in this case you want R to be as small as possible in the series case and we are going to go through few more examples of this, but I am just showing you intuitively how do you think about it ok. Now, the one thing uh, one thing you can uh, uh, you can get messed up with is uh, people say that at resonance right, the inductor and capacitor cancels out hmm? that is what people tend to say and that is not really true ok. So, why I am saying that is let us look at the currents ok at resonance. So, inductor current versus the, the capacitor current is given by uh, is going to be equal and that is given by the V divided by the Z whatever the voltage you are observing here and then divided by the impedance right. So, in this case what will what we what is the voltage given by is uh, you have this I n right. The voltage is always given by whatever is across the resistor because we said that uh, you know effective impedance cancellation happens right. So, the voltage at this point is given by uh, uh, I times uh, this I n times R ok mod of I n times R and then what is the impedance of this uh, inductance omega naught L right. So, that you can figure out what is the inductance current is and also similarly you can say that what is the capacitor current is given by I n R times omega naught C right because this is 1 over omega naught C and then um, it will go in the numerator because of that. So, let us calculate this value now what is the current what is the inductance current is given by I n R divided by omega naught L let us say ok. So, we already know that this part what is this part? Huh? It is Q right we just said that is a because that is a quality of this network. So, then it is Q times I n ok and now you can quickly see that if Q is 1000 let us say ok. The, and if this is like 1 milliamp a typical number let us say then what is the value of the current inductor current huh? 1 amp ok. So, this is a really large number ok. Now, in real life when you are designing circuits you have to be aware of this effect happening. So, they do not really do not cancel out uh, like what we say ok. They, uh, they are there ok and this this is really happening ok in that circuit. So, you have to watch out uh, because if you do not if you do not um, draw these lines uh, thick enough right then then they will blow up at resonance 
at resonance this condition is true and you are going to get magnified currents. Uh, it's just that they will uh, cancel amongst themselves, but they will not be presented to the resistor, but uh, and they are out of phase right that way. So, uh, so you have to take into account uh, the current which is flowing through either of them uh, in, 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 the, in the inductor versus uh, the capacitor. Okay? So, you can have a really large currents circulating between the inductance and capacitor um, and you can really blow up uh, you know these connections uh, because of these large currents if you did not design uh, those components and the, the wire values correctly. I am just giving you an exaggerated example over here. So, let us um, let us look at the other implication of this uh, you know bandwidth and Q uh, because this is something that you are used to seeing before. Um, so, let us uh, say look at the behavior close to uh, resonant frequency. frequency okay so frequency of resonance is omega naught and then we are going to add w delta w to it okay so we're going to just look at the circuit right next to that omega naught so we know our y is uh, g plus j omega c plus 1 over j omega l so you can substitute here um, i'm not going to do all the math here but i'm just going to show you the result but i'll tell you how to do it so, you can substitute omega naught plus delta omega here and plus then 1 over j omega naught plus delta omega L. So, it is like if you remember uh, DC circuits right, you, you look at large signal behavior um, or, or a DC behavior and then on top of that you add a small signal. So, this delta omega is a small signal frequency around the, uh, the resonant frequency that is what we are looking at think about it that way. So, you can um, you can analyze this further okay you can do all the approximations and you know uh, ignore the higher order terms uh, with delta omega square and things like that and what you will see is I will leave that to you to prove. So, you can prove it uh, it is fairly straightforward algebra prove yourself kind of like a homework not graded homework, but for your own understanding. And what you will see is this comes out to be equal to g plus j 2 c delta omega that is the way it looks like. Okay. So, this circuit around resonance behaves like a equivalent circuit is very simple it behaves like 2 c. Okay. At resonance it looks like this if you assume delta omega is a variable frequency variable now. Okay. So, when you plot it what you will see is that you will see a 3 dB drop when uh, you are at 1 over R c sorry 1 over did I say yeah 1 over 2 R c okay. when you this is your omega naught and if you go uh, far uh, you know if you go delta omega of uh, 1 over 2 R c from this omega naught. So, this is plus omega naught okay, 1 over 2 R c you will see a drop in uh, of 3 dB you get that right a roll off that happens okay. and similarly you can do it on the other side also. So, if you go here what you will see is if you go omega naught minus 1 over R c 2 R c then you will get another 3 dB drop. Okay. So, now you can see the familiar uh, behavior um, if your quality factor is really high then what do you expect the thing to be like this okay it should be like a real tone but if the quality factor is bad then it will start becoming flatter and flatter okay so this is the bandwidth of this particular uh, circuit and this bandwidth is given by 1 over rc okay 3 dB on this side and 3 dB on the on the other side okay so the q is also defined as then if you look at the q omega naught over bandwidth is equal to what is omega naught over band what is the bandwidth we said uh, 1 over rc right okay and right there it is omega naught rc which is again equal to q so this is another definition for q so, Q is defined uh, you know if you just look at the spectrum then you can say that oh, Q is defined by omega naught divided by bandwidth of the 
uh, what you see over there. So it's a new definition for Q. So higher Q, you'll see smaller bandwidth. Is this clear? So similarly, we can we did this all this analysis for a parallel RLC circuit. Now we can do the same thing for series RLC circuit also. But I'll just show you the result for that. So if you do if for a series RLC, you will apply a voltage. And here you can use the current uh, through the inductor. Huh? So here um, L, C and R and this is my voltage V we are applying. So in this case Q will be equal to as I said omega naught L divided by R because R should be as small as possible, right. So if R is small then uh, you, will, you will get a really high Q and which is what makes sense, right. For an induct series resistance with an inductor you should have as small and then also you can uh, it's also equal to 1 over omega naught C times R. So R should be small, okay. So um, let me summarize one more time component quality. Because this part is really important. Um, the intuition behind uh, all these networks, don't try to memorize series ke liye ye equation hai, parallel ke liye ye equation hai. Don't think about it like that because then you will really get confused and you will not get make any way. And um, you know, so so think think about it this way. Let's take an inductor, and okay. So this is since it's a series uh, circuit I'm showing you. Let's note it as LS and RS. Okay. So can somebody tell me what the Q expression for this inductor is? Huh? Raise hand and say. Huh? RS should be in the numerator or denominator. Denominator, okay. So first figure that out and then everything will be easy. So in this case, it's RS is in the denominator and top you will see omega naught L, okay. All right. And it should be LS because RS is small. Now let's do capacitor similarly. RS uh, and C, uh, CS. What is the Q? RS will be the numerator or denominator? Denominator, it stays there. And then, yeah, it will be 1 over omega naught C, right? Cs. So then, as a result, it will come over here Cs. All right. So Rs is small. So that's the key takeaway I, I would like you to, to, you know, take from here. And then, similarly, we can do. Uh, So this is LP, RP, so Q is given by numerator, denominator, RP, numerator, right? It has to be large and then on the bottom you get omega naught LP and similarly for a capacitor, RP, CP, Q is equal to Rp times omega naught Cp, okay. So, you know, keep this etched in your memory basically. Uh, how do you get this? Once you, once you get the hang of this, then everything will fall in place. The rest of the stuff that we are going to talk about. Next thing I want to talk about is, uh, how much time do we have? 10 more minutes, right. So, I think. Yeah, the matching part I would like to probably push it out to next in next class. Okay, so let's talk about uh, this maximum power transfer, right? That happens. So let's take a generic example. Um, again, I'm not going to uh, go through all the equations, uh, but I will I will show you the result. Basically, let's take a generic example. We all know that uh, if the two impedances are matched, then uh, then the maximum power is transferred. But I want to do a complex example, and in the complex example, what do we do? We say Zs is equal to Rs plus Jxs, 
and then Z uh, L is equal to R L plus J X L okay and then let us say this is the uh, B R at this point and this is V S okay. So, what is the power delivered to the load that is what we want to figure out right. To R L that is given by uh, V R square divided by R L right because that is R L is the real part of the output impedance and um, what we can do here is I will just take one example. So, that you can see the, the power delivered P L is equal to real part of uh, V R and I R okay. And uh, these are peak phasors, so I'm going to divide them by two, okay, uh, for uh, for RMS portions. Okay, so let's see um, what is uh, voltage across uh, over here um, is given by. Can somebody say? Vr is given by uh, as we did again ZL divided by. Um, Z L plus uh, Z S times V S and then I R is given by V S divided by Z L plus Z S right. I think that is obvious. So, if you if you go through this again one more time um, I do not want to do the math, but uh, what I am showing you is P L is going to I will give you the result first. So, V S square R L divided by 2 times R L plus R S square plus X L plus X S square ok. So, this is the result that you will get after going through grinding through some algebra and uh, what then we want to find out is uh, D P L by uh, D R L ok is equal to 0. So, you want to take a derivative of this and uh, you want to figure out what is the value of the resistance under which I can uh, get a perfect match. And similarly, you want to do D P L uh, by D X L is equal to 0 ok. What is the value of X L under which I will get and what you will see is that the well known result that you already have that um, what should be the uh, that you expect R L should be equal to R S ok and then X L should be equal to minus X S ok. So, th this is the way you figure it out I, I just wanted to bring it to your attention that that is the way. So, basically you should have a complex conjugate match um, and um, ok. So, that is uh, that's that. The next thing I wanted to talk about is um, in 5 minutes is, uh, is something uh, that you will see in RF uh, quite a lot which is again this is from a Lee book uh, 229 page number. Um, but I wanted to bring it out here so that you have a perspective. So, um, there is a you know if, if you are working in the RF space some places you will see 50 ohms, some places you will say 75 ohms and you wonder where all this stuff is coming from right. So, I just wanted to touch up on that uh, in the next 5 minutes so that you will uh, you will understand where it comes from. So, typically if you look at a coaxial cable right that coaxial cable looks like this right you have this as A and then you have this other outer uh, outer conductor is at B ok right. So, um, um, this is to be uh, we use it um, for all the TV connections right TV cable connections and typically if you remember old times you used to have antenna on top of your roof and there is a long cable going all over the map and even now if you if you look at your dish antenna and everything right you have this long cable coming to your house. So, this cable can be hundreds of meters could be and what is the most important thing that you want as a quality of this cable can you tell me huh? Every time you have a, lay, a cable right you will have a resistance and you will have a loss. So, in this cable you want the loss to be as minimum as possible right otherwise the power delivered to your 
LNA uh, inside your satellite TV box will be very little, right? Because you'll have lost everything. So you want to minimize the loss in this cable, okay? Now, um, so uh, you want to maintain a Z naught, which is the characteristic impedance of this uh, of this cable, but at the same time you want to minimize the loss. So the loss is. Uh, again, I'm doing a lot of hand wavy analysis right now because I have not exp I have, I have not explained all the equations uh, from uh, you know the cable communications. But the loss is given by alpha uh, of R divided by uh, two z naught, and then um, let me not write all that stuff. It's given in this one. But to minimize the loss, what happens is um, you can um, when you when you analyze uh, the losses in that cable right uh, for A and B these ratios, what you will come up with, um, uh, with is that uh, ratio of B over A, okay. I'm just giving you the result right now, should be 3.6, okay. And then that leads to Z naught equal to, the Z naught is given by, I don't expect you to remember any of this, this is just inside that I'm providing you, okay, uh, is uh, square root of, uh, I'm not able to see, that's why. Okay, all right. So Z naught is uh, you will get something like 77 ohms. Okay, so in the RF world, the Z naught is used as 75 ohms. Okay, for for that purpose, the purpose is to minimize the losses. And you can the way you figure it out is you look at the expression for the loss that that will have um, A and B terms in it for that cable, and then you uh, usual do derivatives and minimize the loss. And when you do the derivative, minimize the loss, you will get an expression for B over A. And that gives you the value Z naught should be 77 ohms. And for engineers being practical, you know, 77 is like a weird number, so you use 75 ohms. So that's the reason 75 ohms, you will see it everywhere whenever there is a cable communication, okay. But um, on the other side, when we, when we look at um, equipment, right, test equipment um, in, in lab or uh, any place where you want to deliver power, okay, you're delivering large power to a power amplifier or to an antenna. Okay, so in those cases, what happens is that this um, this is not the only uh, only deciding factor. Okay, so power handling capacity. Okay, when that is important, right, for test equipment. So test equipment uh, or anything you put it in the lab, uh, you know, you will have to deliver certain amount of power to your amplifier or you, you want to deliver a lot of power like 0 dBm or even more than that, you know, 20 dBm which is, what is 20 dBm? How many milliwatts? 30 dBm is 1 watt, right? So 20 dBm is 100 milliwatt, that's a lot of power that you want to deliver. Then in that situation, the cable. Uh, should not break down. Basically, it should be able to handle the handle the power. So, in that case, um, if you you have to worry about the maximum electric field in the cable, okay, and that is given by V uh, divided by A times L of B. Um, okay, I'm just giving you the inside. Don't no need to remember these equations. And uh, so, again, you know, you can you can go through the derivation of. Um, uh, maximizing the power handling capability and you will get that B over A when you take the derivative you will see B is equal to 30 ohms, okay. So now 30 ohms and 75 ohms, uh, right. So there are two distinct numbers. Per, so as a compromise between the two, they use 50 ohms and that's where the number 50 ohm comes from, okay. So I just wanted you to know where these two numbers come from. But you will most likely see 50 ohms or 75 ohms in any, any uh, place where you work. Uh, so the reference impedance is one of these two numbers and the re reason for 75 ohms is reducing losses in the cable and re reason for 50 ohms is delivering the maximum amount of power, okay. And those are the two reasons. Now having said that, um, what we do, right, so there is uh, basically a predefined, uh, you know, 50 ohm termination, right. So, for example, you will see uh, a filter design or LNA design where the input is matched to 50 ohms and output is matched to 50 ohms, something like that, okay, or 75 ohms or 75 ohms. So, uh, all this stuff was okay 
in old days, right, where uh, RF circuits were like plumbing, you know. Basically, you, you buy one amplifier from somebody else, you buy a filter from somebody else and you just, you know, connect the cables with a lot of metal, right. So, affectionately everybody calls that plumbing. Uh, so, uh, you know, your amplifier should work with my filter and things like that. So, the standardized impedance is these numbers, right. So, if you are in cable domain, then it is 75 ohms. If, it, if you are in the other domains, then you use 50 ohms. So, However, all that stuff was old times, right, where you have, um, you know, you are plugging in uh, mixer from one guy, LNA from one guy, filter from one guy. So, there you have to do all these things. But when you get inside the chip, right, for example, then you really do not have to do all these things, okay. So, the impedance matching happens only at the interface. So, keep that in mind. Um, uh, let us say you have a chip, right. Uh, for example, if you remember that picture, right, when you go inside the chip. So, that is where you have to do 50 ohm matching or 75 ohm matching, okay, for that amplifier. But once you are inside the chip, you do not need to match to anything else because you are not driving the signal outside. Then you go back to your uh, standard way of voltages and currents and all those things. So, you can, you can do that. And uh, I just want to keep that in mind um, in terms of high level, um, you know, how this thing works. All right, already past time. So I'll see you next time. TS have any announcement? No, everything okay. Um, we will put up. So thing for me to do is put up the lecture notes for the two classes and uh, the schedule of uh, tests and all the details, right? So we'll do that tomorrow, and then you can take a look at it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>